change in work from within the policy di dialogue. These activities in line with the national observance of the Women's Month held in March every year. But before we begin with the presentation of our speakers today, I'd like to request everyone to please read what's on the piece of paper provided by the Secretariat about Sligo. Okay. So for this forum, we'll be using this online application to crowdsource questions for you. Okay. So some of our questions questions that will be generated by Slido will be read and flashed on the screen and will, and will be answered by the, speak, by the speakers during the open forum. But for those who do not want to use the tool, you can still use the microphone provided at the back. So to, form, to uh, form a new beginner seminar, may we request our new and first woman president, Dr. Sylvia Reyes, for the opening remarks.
regular regular um, seminar series as we try to expand our research program on gender. Thank you. So thank you very much, Matt. We have invited research speakers from the government sector accompanied by the CSO who will give us in the um, discussions about uh, women related issues that will give you a brief background about them according according to their sequence in presenting their topics. Okay. So as I call your name, please stand up so uh, the participants may know you. We'll start with Dr. Jose Roman Albert. Okay. Dr. Albert is a senior research fellow here at Leeds from September 2012 to February 2014. Dr. Albert was seconded to the now defunct National Statistical Coordination Board to head as its Secretary General. He is a professional statistician and has written on topics spanning poverty measurement and analysis, education statistics, agricultural statistics, climate change, survey uh, design, data mining, and statistical analysis of New Zealand. Dr. Albert's co presenter and co author is Dr. Clarissa Dabit. Dr. David is a, is a professor in the College of Mass Communication at the University of the Philippines. She conducts research in public opinion, political communication, public interventions, and communicating policy. In addition to academic research, she conducts policy-oriented research and communication strategy consulting in the areas of public education, health, and governance in the Philippines. The third speaker is Ms. Maricel Aguilar. is the National Project uh, Officer of the, of the UN Women based in Manila that focuses on women, peace, and security. She currently leads the team implementing <coughs> actions in support of the Comprehensive Agreement on Ibang Samoro, particularly on women's political participation, gender-sensitive transitional justice, and women and girls' role in preventing violent extremism. Ms. Aguilar has also done many gender, gender and development works in the Philippines and overseas. She has previously worked at the then National Commission on the Role of Women, now known as the Philippine Commission on Women, as well as a volunteer for an NGO in West Africa, a gender and politics officer in a Spanish NGO, and as the lead technical officer implementing the Philippine National Action Plan on Women, Peace and, and Security, under the office of the Presidential Advisor on the Peace <coughs> Process. Our fourth speaker is Ms. Maria Christine. Christine Josefina Balmes. Okay. Ms. Balmes is currently in the Philippine Commission on Women's Deputy Executive Director for Operations and Provincial President of Partido Democratico Filipino Lakas ng Bayan or the PDP Laban. Um, she, she, prior to this, she was the official candidate for mayor in Ibataca City under the PDP in 2016, a member of the Sanguni Ang uh, Panlunsot, a city councillor in Batangas City from 1998 to 2001, and from 2013 to 2016. She, is also she was also a member of the Sanguni Ang Barangays, Barangay Councillor in Batangas City from 1997 to 1998. Okay, now that we know the background of our speakers, let us now have the presentation of Dr. Cruz Albert to be followed by Dr. Women and men, and uh, and uh, 
And so I, I get very excited about it, but at the same time, sometimes when we, when we show this on Facebook, that hey, we discuss something about women, uh, some people, some men particularly, are the ones who are the most <coughs> reactive about this issue and, and start saying uh, even things like, they, they, they say, well, it's not a question about gender, it's a question about uh, you know, competencies, you know? Uh, are, I say, well, who, who defines competencies? Also the men, right? <laughs> Anyways, uh, <laughs> um, so let me just uh, start off uh, this, this presentation on, uh, which is part of the work we did on, on how the country fares on gender equality. pertaining to the monitoring of gender equality in the SDGs and also discuss indicators of women's economic empowerment in the country. Then Clarissa will uh, be discussing the extent of women leadership in both the public and private sectors as well as the safety of women and girls and uh, then ending with some policy issues and ways forward. We know that in September 2015, uh, the, uh, as the MDG period came to a close, the Philippines together with 192 other UN member states committed to attaining the SDGs by 2030. The SDGs follow the unfinished agenda of the MDGs. Uh, they consist of a set of 17 goals, double the eight MDGs, and are supported by 169 targets, about eight times the number of targets, uh, uh, the number of MDG targets, across 232 indicators, nearly four times the number of MDG indicators. So among the 17 goals of the, uh, is SDG 5, a global goal to achieve gender equality um, and empower all women and girls. There are nine targets and, and 14 indicators for SDG 5. Each of these SDG 5 targets seeks to pursue the main goal of, of sustained and real gender equality in all aspects of women and girls' lives. These targets include ending discrimination, eliminating violence against women and girls, eliminating early and forced marriage, ensuring equal participation and opportunities for leadership and universal access to sexual and reproductive rights. Further, there are also 54 other targets and 71 other indicators spanning 13 other goals that are gender and gender related. The SDG 5 targets is composed of uh, multiple indicators. For example, the uh, target 5.5, to ensure women's full participation in leadership at all levels of decision making in political and economic and public life. Uh, we have uh, two indicators on the proportion of seats held by women in national parliaments and local governments, as well as, second, the proportion of women in managerial positions. Of these two indicators, only the second one uh, belongs to what, what are known as the tier one indicators, which have a clear and established methodology, and for which data are regularly collected by many countries. While the first indicator, the proportion of seats held by women in national parliaments and local governments, has only the first component that is tier one. While the second component is still not quite clear uh, how we calculate it, although in our country we can readily calculate this based on data from what are the local governments, but the thing is, in other countries, it's a little bit dif difficult to say what, what we mean by local governments because of the nature of their governments. They may be federal, you know, so anyways. Uh, so we'll be showing you later some of the data on the, on the LGUs and the Senate and House. Uh, but due to time constraints, um, we will only give you a summary of research findings that discuss the condition of women and girls in the country. So as mentioned by Dr. Reyes earlier, various assessments such as the Global Gender Report of the World Economic Forum have indicated that the Philippines seems to be doing quite well in gender outcomes, uh, particularly in ASEAN since 2006. <coughs> but specific indicators and data disaggregation also point to some areas where gender gaps persist. One such indicator is the is sex, getting sex disaggregated data on labor participation rate. 
which is defined as a total percentage of working age persons aged 15 years and over who are part of the labor force. While only a fifth of males are not part of the labor force, about half of working age females are not economically active. And this trend, as shown in the, in the graph here, um, has been stagnant since 2006. So for women, this may be the result of them getting discouraged from looking for a job due to the high burden of unpaid work that women bear, leaving much of their work in employment and in the home uncounted in labor statistics. Lower labor force participation among women is noticeable across all ASEAN member states and even in many countries across Asia and the Pacific. Many analysts can find this a bit puzzling considering that the gender gap in education has narrowed considerably in Asia Pacific and even reversed in some countries such as the Philippines. To examine what various factors that influence labor market participation um, have the most weight among women, we actually run a logistic regression on 24,000 females with spouses across sample households interviewed in the January round of the 2016 labor force survey. And our results suggest that all explanatory, ex explanatory variables held constant. First, age matters. In other words, the older the woman, the less likely she is to be part of the labor force. The more educated the woman, the more likely she is in the economically active population. The more years of educational attainment of her spouse, the less likely she will be part of the labor force. The more children she has, the more likely she is to be in the labor force, but the ages of her children matter. If the woman also were older when she had her first child, she would more likely be economically active. Further, location matters. Women in real rural areas are 1.13 times more likely to be in the labor force than their corresponding urban counterparts. And compared to married women living in NCR, married women residing in 12 regions out of 16 other regions, um, namely Cagayan, Ilocos, I, I, I won't list, I won't name all of them, are more likely to be part of the labor force, while in one region, namely ARM, the married women are less likely to be in the labor force than their NCR counterparts. Now when we examine also sex disaggregated data on unemployment rate, in other words, the ratio of the total number of unemployed to the corresponding labor force, we find that roughly equal, we find roughly equal unemployment rates among men and women, which might lead us to think that you know we have the same economic opportunities for men and women. But actually, when you disaggregate the employment by sex across sectors, we, we find uh, that women, men and women are situated differently across the job market. A third of in, in particular in 2015, a third of working women are engaged in agriculture, over two-fifths are in services, and a fifth in industry, while as much as seven out of ten working women are in the services sector. A tenth are in industry, and a fifth, 20%, are in agriculture. Men are observed to outnumber women by a large majority in work as laborers, farmers, trade, and, uns uh, and unskilled workers. The largely fe female-dominated industries are education, services, service activities, human health and so social work, retail trade and accommodation, and food and services, service activities. Meanwhile, men dominate construction, transportation, agriculture, administrative and support services, and uh, information and communication. Filipino women who are formally employed are more likely than men to be in white collar occupations, but they are mostly uh, professionals and clerks. And in the Philippines, the proportion of workers in vulnerable employment, such as in account workers and contributing family workers, which has been decreasing over the past one and a half de decades, but it turns out that women tend to have a bigger share of vulnerable employment than men. And recent data uh, suggests that about seven in 20 women, that seven in 10 to 20 men are in vulnerable employment compared to 8 in 20 for women. ILO data shows that more women and, than men are in vulnerable employment in several ASEAN member states, including the Philippines, uh, and these, those in vulnerable employment are less likely to have formal work arrangements and are therefore more likely to have decent, are more likely to lack 
decent work con working conditions, adequate social security, and voice. Vulnerable employment is often, often characterized by inadequate earnings, low productivity, and difficult conditions of work that undermine workers' fundamental rights. And as far as the gender gap in wages is concerned, it might seem that there is a gender gap, that, that the gender wage gap is in favor of men throughout ASEAN, but in the Philippines, it seems that we're slightly <coughs> earning, the women are slightly earning more than men. In Cambodia, wage, earn, wage gaps have increased further in favor of men to yield the wage, highest wage gap across the region, followed closely by Singapore. Thailand has the least wage gap next to the Philippines, <coughs> but the gap in Thailand still favors men unlike here in the Philippines, where women have the, seemingly have the, 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 uh, um, the advantage. But data disaggregation on the gender gap, uh, wage gap, suggests that there might be, that the averages are masking what is going on in specific occupations. High level positions, such as officials of government and special interest organizations, corporate executives, managers, managing proprietors and supervisors generally have wages favoring women, with women having a bigger share, bigger share than men in this occupation. But for some occupations, particularly technicians, associate professionals, clerks, service workers, and shop and market sales workers, men are much better compensated despite women having a bigger share in occupational employment. The widest disparity here is among the professionals group. Since women in professional fields appear more likely to be in managerial and supervisory positions than men, and as a group more likely to be in professional and service occupations, they are all also going to be highly paid in highly paid positions. In consequence, while we see that women have made some headway in economic opportunities, with even the overall wage gap in their favor, they still face disadvantages compared to men as half of them do not join the labor force. While when they are employed, a bigger share of women are in the services sector and in vulnerable employment compared to men. Unpaid work is central to the issue of vulnerable employment. Unpaid work also extends to unpaid care work, which is not shown in statistics on labor outcomes and clearly contributes to time poverty of women. While the gender gap favors, seems to favor women in the Philippines, as I mentioned earlier, averages are masking disparities between the sexes in pay differentials across various occupational groups. Thus, government will really need to play a more important role in ensuring that quality jobs are created and that economic opportunities are equal for both sexes. It will be important to examine why the gender gap really uh, uh, persists in some occupations, but not in all. Further, government needs to provide the proper interventions for addressing these gender-based uh, gender barriers so that everyone can be given opportunities for becoming economically active and for capacity development and for career development. And allow me now to turn the floor of the ceiling to Clarissa. Thank you. Congress representatives, only 28.6% are women. For 
governors, only 23.5% of women are women. And then the lower you go in the um, in the local government offices, particularly in the barangay elections, there are very few women that run, and about the same proportion of women win. So if we look at the, the distribution of women across in the electoral positions, we'll find that if you run, your odds of winning are the same as men. But the issue is women are not running. So that is the first barrier that we need to go to work on. Women in legislature also have, so this, same, this chart is the proportion of seats held by women in single or lower houses of national parliament in 2016. This came from another paper, doesn't include the Philippines specifically, but I included it here for comparison purposes. For us in the House of Representatives, it's 28.6%. 16.7% in the Senate. In the Senate, the numbers by election changes dramatically in percentages because there's only 34 senators. So one or two senat women senator leave, senators leave, then the percentages will, will change dramatically. But some issues in, in the House, in the legislature in particular, the issues are that when there are women, they tend to be in very stereotype committee um, assignments. So women that are, some issues that are traditionally championed by women, are health, nutrition, education, youth protection, children, women's health, family planning, housing. These are not things that men typically take <coughs> leadership of. At the same time, women are not usually leaders in areas of finance, economy, trade, infrastructure. So the assignment of um, legislators into committee positions are very gendered. And the issue with that, especially with very few women in relation to men, is that as a political a political issue and to get attention for budget for various things that the legislature does, it makes it more difficult for women's issues. They're not really women's issues. They're issues women care about because education and health are not women's issues. Those are issues of everybody. Child nutrition is not a woman's issue. It's, a, it's an issue of everybody. But it's the women <coughs> legislators that tend to gravitate towards advocating for these kinds of, um, these kinds of areas. So by not having enough women in Congress, uh, both Senate and House, the concern for us is really whether the issues that women tend to care deeply about, which are social development issues, human capital issues, they tend not to have as much attention as the infrastructure or trade. So the committee assignments are highly gender stereotyped in both House of Representatives and the Senate. There have been no female chairs in committee assignments. There have been no female chairs in both houses of HR and Senate in the last three Congresses for committees on public accountability, banks and financial institutions, civil service and government reorganization, ethics and privileges, labor and employment, local government, urban reorg, public works, rules, and science and tech. The, the, the areas or committees where there tend to be women leaders are cultural communities, women and gender equality, those kinds of areas. So the issue also is since you have few women in the houses in legislature. They get assigned to Senate <coughs> to committee chair. Nauubos yung slots nila, di ba? So you really, as a, as a legislator, will only have so many committees you can serve on. So if you tend to be put in these highly gendered committees, you don't have time to be participating with others or leading the others. Women in the executive is also a, pro a problem. Uh, I think less of a problem, but still a problem. Across positions consistently below 25% of elected officials in the executive are women. They, they, the problem isn't likely that they won't win. When they run, their odds of winning are the same as men. The problem is that they don't run. So the percentage of female candidates in national and local elections in the 2013 elections was only 18%. In 2019, in 2016, it was only 19%. Elected in national and local is 20 and 21. So hindi rin po bago masyado yung percentage from candidates na to elect elections. Elected barangay captains in 2013 was only 18%. These are really, really small in relation to the in relation to the rest. So what we have, we can imagine what that means for actual governance on the ground for say barangay governance. That also needs to be more carefully legislated. Females appointed to the cabinet are also highly gendered in terms of appointments. In the sec we reviewed all secretary appointments <coughs> been no women secretaries for the, de the departments of agriculture, defense, public works, interior, and local government. There have been less than 10% women appointed to the departments of 
Secretary Reform, Energy, Environment, Finance, Foreign Affairs, Trade and Industry, Transportation, and Economic Development. Social welfare, except for the current OIC, there will be no women appointed. No men appointed. Uh, so it is clearly very, very gender, and gender uh, guided by gender stereotypes. When we did interviews, we did some interviews of people who are either currently barangay captains or concejal or in some elected office. Um, some of the concerns that came up were that women in legislature, for example, don't really work with each other much to push for issues that are important to women. So there's not a lot of cooperation among women to really push for things that they care about. Uh, they don't, there's no clear uh, organization to protect each other. And this is not true for the judiciary. For the judiciary, there's the association of women judges, and they're very well organized. So there's no similar movement for the legislature. There's rampant sexism and misogyny in Congresses. It makes women's and LGBT rights and issues difficult to champion. I mean, I don't need to explain this to you, there is rampant. I don't think anybody here would disagree that there is rampant sexism and misogyny in both houses. Uh, in nationally elected positions, they are subjected to sexist challenges and questions. How will you balance, balance parenting with politics? Is that something that you would ask a man, congressperson? No, you only ask it of the women. Are you strong enough to play politics? Politics is considered too dirty an area for women. Same as industry, there is not enough uh, flexibility in schedules to allow mothers of small children, for example, to serve in offices. Same as industry, there's a perceived old boys club of local politics that can be hostile to women and keep women away. Women in the judiciary is the model. There was a rapid increase in proportion of women judges in the last 15 it went from 20% women judges in 2000 to 43.8% in 2013, that's almost half. That is really an incredible rise. It's guided by organized efforts to promote more women to protect their interests. There's a Philippine Women Judges Association that's large and internationally affiliated with memberships and leadership from top levels of judiciary to the bottom. So they have a really organized way of promoting more women in their ranks. In the industry, uh, we spoke with people who are in vice president positions or up in, uh, in ratifying positions. Across the, in the Philippines, about 11% of board members are women, so that's really low in large companies. About 30% of executives are women. So even with the labor force itself, when you go into the industries and service industries, maraming babae. Hanggang manager, director, maraming babae. But when you get up to the very top levels of executive, C-level offices, the C-suite and the boards, they tend to, to get lower as the positions get higher. Uh, but a lot of literature has shown that women leaders can bring many benefits to companies. They can make, when you have women leaders, they can make working environments safer for all women, which can improve retention of women in the long run. There are more women than men in manager and director positions, but they tend to stay there. Somehow they don't get higher. And then they tend to be sector-wise very different. So for example, in the finance and banking sector, iba talaga ang treatment sa mga babae. So they, they, tend, they tend not to get to the higher positions. Commitments to ethics and standards, loss avoidance focus, and understanding of female consumers are all the benefits that can be brought by having more leaders in, uh, women leaders in industries. There's a decline, sharp decline in female leadership in top management and C-level positions uh, across many industries. So there, what are the barriers to promotion? A lot of it is opt out. A lot of it is not straight out discrimination. I'm not going to promote you because you're a woman. A lot of it is that women see hostile work environments for themselves in that particular industry and therefore will move to a different uh, part of the office or a different, uh, uh, different industry altogether. Women leave positions, promotions, departments, departments because of family and home care work. So unpaid care work is a huge issue. For children, elderly, parents, whoever's sick in the family, somehow it's always the woman that needs to take a step back. Women shift out of areas where men are dominant, where work cultures are conducive, are not conducive to women. Because in these, these are the sectors where you see a lot of sexual harassment. Uh, women are expected to go out drinking with the clients. Even the old boys club thing, golfing at five in the morning, drinking on a Saturday after Sunday evening to entertain a client, going to strip bars. These are still practices <coughs> that even though people don't think about it much, really will turn off women from the entire industry. Why, as a woman, would you subject yourself to something like that? So female-dominated industries 
tend to have more flexible work and new arrangements, which means that when women are leaders, they understand what women need in order to effectively perform in the workplace. Expansion of maternity benefits will be a benefit, but it's not enough to supplant the issues of male-dominated areas. Policies which encourage gender equal home responsibilities, like family leave benefits for men, men should have just as much maternity leave as women if we want them to really participate in parenting and really split the work. Either one of you are a right? Uh, and then meaningful gender sensitivity and anti-sexual harassment policies are necessary. There is still harassment, no matter how high up the ladder you go, women still really um, are subject to being propositioned for relationships in the workplace. Their, the reporting systems, while present, uh, are not within an enabling environment, so you have to encourage people to report when they witness sexual harassment by employees. There's no real programs for prevention. Sexual harassment policies tend to be after it happens, <coughs> we deal with it, but prevention is not so much the focus. Effective gender sensitive interventions are nuanced and should be targeted towards men, towards enabling third party reporting and safe space for reporting for women. Women who get to the top can handle it. So the women leaders who get to the very, very top are a certain type of woman that are not likely to report. Because in order to get there, they don't rock the boat. Or they feel like they can handle it, they don't feel, make themselves feel strong, and then it's something that they can handle. But the problem is, that doesn't help all the other women below who have to deal with it. Right? So, so th these are all the nuanced things that we need to really think about how to um, address. Workplace cultures of male-dominated offices systematically lead to exclude women in informal practices that keep women away like entertaining clients off hours, socializing outside of work, giving women, so you know, this is interesting, if you go to the video on it. I, I, this is actually three or four times I've interviewed this. Giving women the work na mag-GRO in the events, uh, you stand here in front and greet the guests, or I had one interviewee who said that in, in a male-dominated office, what they did, uh, they were having an event, and what, there's only a handful of women, so they got scattered around in different tables to make it look <coughs> like that they would be hosting that table. So there's a lot of that, and I don't think it's benign. Uh, women notice it, and women consider it problematic. It requires really a radical and aggressive diversity program to change culture. So we spoke with a lot of women who work for multinationals, where they have <coughs> specific diversity programs to increase women in the ranks. So this is not something that we will fix just by talking about it, there, and just by encouraging women. There really has to be very proactive affirmative action type policies. On violence against women, there's an SDG that states, eliminate all forms of violence against all women <coughs> in the world in the public and private spheres, including trafficking and sexual and other types of exploitation. We have relatively progressive laws to protect women and girls from violence. As usual, our issues tend to be in the implementation side. More focus, there's more focus in the laws on punitive measures, less focus on preventive measures. And the remaining laws that penalize victims of prostitution and trafficking really need to be taken out of the, the legal framework. In their implementation problems that need to be fixed and studied, so how, pe how law enforcement officials deal with women and girls being trafficked across borders, the repeated interviews that, again, that victimize them over and over, it happens all the time, the volleying of victims from one barangay to another, because they don't really know how to deal with it or they don't want to, they don't have the budget. So it makes it very difficult for people running the viol against, violence against women desk to really do the work they're supposed to be doing. So the legal environment <coughs> is enabling on some issues and constraining on others. There's been a small reduction of violence against women, um, but it's very small. The national, nationally in 2008 it was 20.1%, in 2013 it was 19.6%. To the extent you think that decrease, uh, maybe I wouldn't even officially consider it a decrease, but almost the same. Most violence is at the hands of the closest members of the family. 51.6% of those experienced violence are abused by domestic partners. 56% are abused by parents or step-parents. So a lot of this happens in the home. 13% of women still believe beating by the husband can be justified, mostly for neglect of the children, which is something that we need to work on. Uh, and notably in the research, I noticed a very glaring omission, which is that there's a lot of research that looks at the behavior and attitudes of women, not um, men. So we keep focusing.
focusing on the people who are the victims and studying the victims. We need to focus on studying the perpetrators so we can figure out um, mm -hmm. effective policy. The remaining agenda for violence against women, there are many broad dedicated agenda challenges. Um, that I'm sure our other speakers will deal with it better than I will, but I'll talk a little, a little more in depth about the implementation challenges. Uh, we spoke with many people who said that the issues really are a lot of it is administrative. Literally, how do we handle budgets? How can we pay for a shelter for a child who came to them and said they were being beaten by their parents? So the overburden on, let's say, BSWB, uh, social workers at the municipal level, that needs to be systematically understood. Their mandate is so overburdened that you can't expect them to do much of anything anymore because they're trying to do too much, too many things. So an audit of the, the work that we have bur placed on social workers should give us some guidance on how to fix it as a policy to make sure that we share some of this burden so we can really implement the laws effectively. Um, so for, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what that means. To some of, I've just highlighted some of the things. Uh, we have a full discussion paper that really, uh, maybe we'll leave, no? We have a full discussion paper that discusses all of this very specifically, but just some highlights. We need to ensure that economic opportunities are equal to both sexes. And the issue of sex-based distribution in industry, I think we need to we need to start in college. We need to stream women and encourage them in areas where they tend not that, that they tend not to pick. So banking, finance, economics, um, engineering, the STEM courses. And science is actually okay the bad thing. Uh, but because it starts there, when you recruit them into industry, they tend to be gendered when they get there. So one thing that we can do is start at to stream them, uh, encourage some kind of streaming into typically male-dominated areas in the higher education sector. Address gender-based barriers that hinder opportunities for capacity development and career advancement. Uh, go to some of these. I think it would be very useful to look at a time use survey, what Dr. Cook was saying about women doing so much unpaid, unaccounted for work, uh, to get a really good handle on how much work that is. It would be worth it to do a time use survey different kinds of women, people, women who have, um, women who are working in agriculture, women who are working as teachers, etc. women who have children, women who don't. There was a recent study that came out um, in the U.S. that said that if you look at the working the working hours of women, uh, it's two and a half times uh, full, full load, kumbaga, full load, uh, uh, full time work, two and a half times. So on top of that, they still work pa. Uh, so we need to conduct more studies to examine reasons behind dominance of one sect over the other in some occupations, as well as the persistence of gender wage gaps in specific sectors and occupations. I have some uh, things to highlight in women in leadership. I think we should really start seriously studying the possibility of quota systems in politics, encouraging more women to run, maybe at the level of political parties. This is, we need to engage with people who are working in the electoral system to figure out how we can do this. In industry, the issues are in work cultures. In disciplinal gender divides, I would say, let's start with high school and college. And then equal share of home responsibility is something that we really need to push. Because my, my whole goal here is that we keep telling women that they need to do more, that they need to lean in, but who's going to pick up the slack? So because there's always slack, if you pick, some, if you pick something up, you're always putting something down. Who will pick that one up? Uh, and it's all women down the line. So to get to work, you hire somebody to take care of your children. Those are also women. And then those women are going to leave their own children to work for you. So all of this is highly gendered. We need to really look at the accounting of how this whole thing, uh, this supply chain works. In, in Bausi, uh, you can please read the paper, but I think one of the main things is a full implementation of the RH law is doomed. It really needs to be done, it needs to be done now, because the high rates of teenage and child pregnancies is one of the largest violences against women and children. Uh, and, ha and when women don't have the ability to select how many children they will have, then they will be, they will be forced out of the, uh, the labor force. Uh, sorry for going over time. Thank you very much.
The first thing that I have in mind is on the one hand, in the Philippine security portfolio, you have an extremely good at in a security app, which is something that we should be looking at in the course of you know, the recent events that happened in Marau, which is, by the way, going to be on this one, first year on May 23. Um, let me begin the paper by saying that Kofi Annan, um, the former U.S. Secretary General, um, defined human security as encompassing human rights, good governance, access to education and health care, and ensuring that each individual has opportunities and choices to fulfill his or her potential. And so, um, and the Philippines has Republic Act uh, 9373, or the Human Security Act of 2007, which defined acts of terrorism penalties, as well as the rights of suspected, uh, of rights of individuals suspected of acts of terrorism, and also the creation of the Anti-Terrorism Council. Um, despite the law, acts of terrorism prevailed, and it has even morphed into more violent acts. In 20, uh, last year, 2017, May 20, May 23, 2017, Violent extremist groups occupied the Islamic city of Marawi, which led to the destruction of the city, the death of 168 civilians, and the displacement of more than 350,000 individuals. As the rehabilitation of the city is underway, violence is escalating in portions of Maguindanao, North Cotabato, Central Mindanao areas. Communist insurgents, on the other hand, are now tagged by the government as terrorists and offensives are likewise intensifying with the rest of the country. Given this, it is imperative to revisit the Human Security Act and situate this piece of legislation with the current realities at the national and local levels. While there may be various ways to review the said law, what I'm trying to point out in this presentation is the use of a gender perspective in looking at the Human Security Act. And to look at the UN um, Secretary General's plan of action on preventing violent extremism as tools that can be used to ensure that a set of people-centered, comprehensive, context-specific, and prevention-oriented responses to human security is you know, looked into. Um, in 2015, uh, the UN Secretary General issued a plan of action on preventing violent extremism, and this is what it contains. It sets the policy framework calls for the development of national and regional action plans and various recommended actions for preventing violent extremism. In this plan of action, it is recognized that one of the crucial elements in preventing violent extremism and sustaining peace is pursuing gender equality and women's empowerment. In societies where gender equality indicators are low, vulnerabilities to violent extremism are high. The lack of social economic opportunities for women, such as education, livelihoods, and employment, is used to lure support for recruitment in violent extremist groups. In the southern Philippines, for example, groups are offering as 12,000 pesos to as high as 35,000 pesos without ammunition, um, without excluding arms and ammunition to families. Families with out of school youths are being targeted by these groups, and the lack of to um, bring this use to school or tech box skills education sets the environment for recruitment. The lack of spaces for women's conscientization, voices, leadership, and participation at the community and local levels is used as an entry point to repress democracy, usually undermining women's human rights. Elsewhere in the world, aside from being recruited to become token brides or jihadi brides, terrorist fighters, women deliver messages that convey and value hyper-masculinity, where fighting a global jihad with force and brutality is the representation of real nationhood. <coughs> with the current trends on national and local security and the emergence of new frameworks and tools, it is worth looking at the Human Security Act and, you know, integrate some um, entry points for engendering. First is to look at the comprehensive approach to human security. Since the definition of the Human Security Act 
because, you know, under the perspective of terrorism and all the penalties that go with it, it is important to look at, um, it is important to revisit the law and include elements of protection and prevention from all forms of threats and violence, including sexual and gender-based violence that is not included in the law. Growth-oriented socioeconomic opportunities for the poor and the marginalized, empowerment and meaningful participation of the vulnerable, especially women and youth, peace and security decisions and decision-making, relief, recovery, and reparations. Again, this is not also included in the, in the current law. Preparations for victims, survivors of violent extremists and terroristic acts, as well as demobilization, demilitarization, and rehabilitation of recruited members. The next one, to engender the Human Security Act, we have to look at preventive measures. Um, the law has to, it is imperative to generate data and information and analyze the factors. There are a lot of studies actually out there on violent extremism, but nothing really looks at um, push and pull factors, or say, for example, using, tre using current trends to actually develop uh, measures to address the effects or impact of violent extremism. As it were, the Republic Act 9710, or the Magna Carta of Women, guarantees the protection and security of women from all forms of violence in the context, context of conflict and militarization. Current mechanisms, however, do not deliberately gather on sexual and gender-based violence in the context of conflict. This has already been done as a study of OPAP in the National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security in 2016. There's no data that completely delineates violence against women and children in the context of conflict. They're all lumped together as violence against women. So that's one area. And that could already provide had <coughs> that this information is generated and populated, then it could have provided trends on increasing militarization or impending threat of radicalization and violent extremism. Another thing that we could look at also in the preventive measures is engaging religious leaders to perform to provide a platform for intra and interfaith dialogue. We have a lot of Muslim religious leaders, female Muslim religious leaders or alimas that could provide peaceful narratives and interpretations of scriptures that can help in transforming and preventing more extremist understanding of, of religious threats, which is usually used for recruitment purposes in violent extremist or terrorist groups. They can issue fatwas, for example, on early enforced marriages or sexual and gender-based violence or violent conflict in general. Maximizing this could create spaces to address the root causes of terrorism consistent with the intent of the Human Security Act. Another possible recommendation is to foster entrepreneurial culture among the youth. Um, in several consultations of UN women with the women of Marawi and the islands of Basilan, Sulu, and Tawi-Tawi, they underscore the mutual reinforcing effect of incomes, livelihoods, and employment since they will have resources to bring in their children to school and prevent them from being recruited or lured to, offer of, to the offer of violent extremist groups. One challenge, however, is to develop creative and innovative ways for such opportunities to thrive or prosper in the context of intermittent and protracted violent conflict and displacement. Isang bomba lang na yan, mawawala yung livelihoods niya. And therefore, there has to be a creative way of looking at you know, building livelihoods for women in fragile um, societies. Another area also for prevention is to um, have joint and participatory strategies with civil society and local communities. Um, in the listening processes made by UN Women um, last year together with the women of Marawi, women respondents in the listening processes recounted that for years now, months and weeks leading to the siege, they have already received SMS. They have about an impending um, occupation of violent extremist groups. There's an escalating violence against LGBTs in Marawi City. Um, movements of foreign nationals. The law could provide measures on establishing early warning measures that could provide early response and mitigate, if not eliminate, severe damages to lives and property. Due consideration, however, must be in place to prevent extracting information at the expense of women's safety and security, as well as that of their families. 
Also, we could make use of strategic communications, labeling perpetrators of violent attacks in mainstream and social media, calling them Muslim or Moro insurgents, Muslim or Moro terrorists, jihadists, so intolerance and hate on certain segments of society. Damaging gender stereotypes are also being used to radicalize and recruit. At the global level, ISIS media presence is largely structured and calculated to draw young men as recruits and employ hyper-militarized, hyper-masculinized, and particularly violent motives to portray its fighters as representations of real men. Women, on the other hand, serves as channels through which these messages are conveyed. The law may need to include provisions to include strategic communications to prevent this damaging labels and stereotypes that inspire intolerance and promote conflict-sensitive and peace-promoting language in mainstream and social media. Very importantly, we need to promote positive values such as respect for diversity, human rights, and gender equality, and educational curriculum and instructional materials. For example, the inclusion of the nation's history of struggles and injustices creates a shared understanding of the root causes of armed conflict towards strengthening national cohesion. Male and female heroes and their narratives in pursuing social justice and human rights can create positive models for the young. Inclusion of reparations for victims of terrorism and violent extremism. Um, right now, this is the issue in Marawi. Um, there's still no compensation being made yet on the victim survivors. Um, there were signs that should compensation, aside from other forms of reparation, are not undertaken soonest, frustration from the IDPs would grow further, which may break into a new form of violent extremism. And there's already one, the, Mara the Maranao Victims Movement. They're already taking up arms. Very, very quickly, I think on the 100th uh, day of the Marawi siege, they've already taken up arms. Um, lastly, there's a need to look into strengthening rehabilitation and reintegration of recruited individuals in society. This is usually lacking in any policy in relation to reform or reintegration of insurgents as well as, say, for example, those who have been recruited in violent <coughs> extremist groups. Female perpetrators in Indonesia, Bangladesh, and even Marawi have shown that the women have their own motivations to draw them into fighting forces and non-recognition of such can create gaps in prevention, rehabilitation, and integration measures. Programs to support women and girls who would want to exit the path to radicalization lead extremist groups and reintegrate into their families and communities are non existent, especially in the current Human Security Act. As male fighters are detained or engaged in reintegration processes, female family members are often ignored. They represent, however, a prime opportunity for continued contact with terrorist organizations and network expansion. Wives of imprisoned members of violent extremist or terrorist groups may become their courier or proxy, continuing their work while in prison. Utmost consideration should likewise be given to the exposure of suspected and detained terrorists <coughs> with the rest of the detainees, halo-halo po pasiyan, as recruitment are likewise continued within detention centers. Into the law, there's no mention of programs aimed at rehabilitating or reintegrating fighters into the general society. A decade has passed after the Human Security Act was enacted. Much has changed in the political and security environment of the country as well as in the international scene. The international framework such as the UN Security Council 1325, 1820, and its succeeding resolutions, and also the UN Security uh, Resolution 2250 on Youth, Peace, and Security, the Secretary General's Plan of Action on Preventing Violence, extremism, SDG 5, SDG 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions. The Philippine National Action Plan we have a lot, a lot of frameworks that we could use to shape the Human Security Act to effectively respond to the current and emerging radicalization, violent conflict, and extremism in the country. And efforts are said to be underway in the review of the law. We've heard this from the Anti-Terrorism Council, but we hope that UN Women hopes that the review would seriously consider gender equality and women's empowerment as its guidepost in politics. Maraming salamat. Month celebration, we make 
and he asked, how have we made change work for women? One of the answers is by making the system work through, for them through legislation. Legislation aimed at addressing gender inequalities is a powerful medium by which women can be empowered. In fact, it has been noted that the changes to the law have enabled women to, among other things, gain the right to education, win property rights, achieve political representation, and ensure access to contraceptives and abortion. These legal changes have impacted on everyday lives and relationships. In the Philippines, gender-responsive legislation, once alienating the halls of the Philippine Congress, has now gradually become part of the legislative agenda. If we are to examine our laws or on women, it will reveal that we have more or less attained some substantive gains to recognize, protect, fulfill, and promote the rights of Filipino women. And one of the more recent landmark legislation on women in the, is the passage of RA 9710 or the Magna Carta of Women or MCW. MCW is a milestone for the women empowerment movement in our country. It took more than a decade and three different congresses before the MCW was signed into law on August 14, 2009. The MCW is the local translation of the provision of of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or SIDA, which is also known as International Bill of Rights for Women. As a state party to SIDA, the Philippines is duty bound to implement its provisions all throughout the country. Hence, the MCW contains provisions that cover the executive, legislative, judiciary, and even the local government units. The MCW is a comprehensive women's right, human rights law that seeks to eliminate discrimination through the recognition, protection, fulfillment, and promotion of the rights of Filipino women, especially those belonging in the marginalized sectors of the society. And the salient features of the MCW, with the passage of the MCW, the following measures are guaranteed. First is the understanding of temporary special measures to accelerate participation and equitable representation of women in all spheres of society, particularly the decision-making and policy processes in government and private entities in order to realize their role as agents and beneficiaries of development. In the civil service, the MCW provision mandates the 50-50 gender balance, especially in the third level positions for development councils and planning bodies, at least 40% should be women. Second, is the non-discrimination in employment in the field of military, police, and other similar services. This include accord, uh, according women the same promotional privileges and opportunities as their men counterpart, including pay increases, additional benefits, and awards based on competency and quality of performance. And third is the provision of equal access and elimination of discrimination in education, scholarships, and training. Thus, expulsion, non-readmission, prohibiting enrollment, and other related discrimination of women, students, and faculty due to pregnancy out of marriage is outlawed. Fourth, fourth is the non-discriminatory and non-derogatory portrayal of women in media and film to raise the consciousness of the general public. Um, in recognizing the dignity of women and the role and contribution of women in family, community, and society through the strategic use of mass media. Fifth is the provision of local government units of services and interventions such as, but not limited to temporary and protection custody, counseling, psychological, evaluation, legal services, productivity skills, capability building to women in especially difficult circumstances or when seen, are victims and survivors of sexual and physical abuse, illegal recruitment, prostitution, and trafficking, armed conflict, women in detention, victims and survivors of rape and incest, and other related circumstances which have incapacitated them functionally. And six, 
six is the adoption of measures to eliminate all forms of discrimination against real children in education, health, nutrition, and skills development. Seven is the protection of women senior citizens from neglect, abandonment, domestic violence, abuse, exploitation, and discrimination. And lastly, is the prohibition of discrimination against women by public and private entities and individuals. Aside from the MCW and prompted by the magnanimous and fiery spirit of women advocates together with other stakeholders, including some legislators, we were able to score victories with the passage of other women-related laws. First is RA-1. 0354 or the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Act of 2012. Though there were specific pertinent provisions that were declared by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional, the heart of the law is to empower the Filipino uh, people, couples, adult individuals, women, and adolescents to have free and informed choice with regards to their sexual and reproductive health which include preference and choice for family planning methods and determination of ideal family size. The law guarantees universal access to effective and quality RH care uh, services, especially to the poor and marginalized, and provision of age and development, appropriate reproductive health education. Next is RA 9262, or the Anti-Violence Against Women and Ch Their Children Act of 2004. This law defines violence against women and children or VALSI as any act or a series of acts committed by any person against a woman who is his wife, former wife, or against a woman with whom the person has or had a sexual dating uh, relationship or with whom he has a common child or against her child, whether legitimate or illegitimate, within or without the family abode, which result in or is likely to result in physical, sexual, psychological harm or suffering or economic abuse, including threats of such acts, battery, assault, coercion, harassment, or arbitrary deprivation of liberty. It gives the offended party a, a, to file a criminal action or apply for protection order, either as an independent action or as an incident in civil or criminal action and other remedies. Next is RA 8972 or the Solo Parents uh, Welfare Act of 2000. The law provides for benefits and privileges to solo parents and their children. Uh, it aims to develop a comprehensive package of social development and welfare services for solo parents and their children. The other women related laws are Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995, Anti-Rape Law of 1997, Anti-Victim Assistance and Protection Act of 1998, Anti-Trafficking in Persons Act of 2003, Anti-Child Pornography Act, Anti-Photo and Video Lawyer Recent Act, an Act Allowing the Employment of Night Workers of 2011, Cyber Crime Prevention Act, uh, domestic Workers Act or Tagas Kasambahay and Anti-Mail Order Spouse Law. But despite this significant uh, legislative victories in the past years, discriminatory provisions still remain in the statute books. The Philippine Commission on Women, as a primary policy-making and coordinating agency on women and gender equality, is tasked by the MCW to review, evaluate, and recommend measures including priorities to ensure the full in integration of women for economic, social, and cultural development at national, regional, and international levels to ensure further equality between women and girls. <coughs> Hence, um, to accomplish this, PCW developed the Women's Priority Legislative Agenda, or what we call WPLA, WPLA is a set of proposed topics of bills that seek to amend or repeal discriminatory provisions of existing laws and advocate for the formulation and passage of new laws and that promote women's empowerment and gender equality. In the 16th Congress, we only were able to pass one law out of the Women's Priority Legislative Agenda 
and that is RA10655. Uh, or an act repealing the crime of premature marriage under RPC Article 351. The law has been eliminated. The, the unfair provision of the uh, revised penal code, which make it criminal for women, but not for men, to remarry within 301 days from the date of the death of her husband. WPLA, for the 17th Congress, we have 12 proposed legislative agenda. The WPLA is a result of a series of consultations with various local women's groups in the Swan Designs in Mindanao and the careful deliberation based on specific criteria to strategically prioritize women and gender equality issues and concerns across the country. The following are the 12 WPLA for the 17th Congress. First, amending the anti-rape law. Uh, it proposes to redefine acts of rape and highlight the essential element of lack of consent. Remove the requirement that sexual assault be committed by force and any requirement of the proof of penetration. Repeal Article 266C, uh, which effect uh, of a uh, pardon of the anti-rape law that subsequent valid marriage with and forgiveness by the offended party should not extinguish criminal liability and the increased age of statutory rape from under 12 years old to under 16 years old. Next, increase the equalizing and maternity leave. The proposed agenda provides for equal maternity leave benefits for employed women regardless of employment status in both the government and private sectors. 100 days paid maternity leave with optional additional 30 days leave without pay and security of tenure to all women employees availing of the maternity leave. Next, amending the revised penal code on adultery and concubinage. It proposes the repeal of RPC Articles 333 and 334 to decriminalize marital infidelity but still consider it as illegal or unlawful and could be used as grounds for legal separation. Continue to be one of the manifestations of psychological violence under RA 9262 and serve as basis to sue for ordinary damages under the civil code against the offending guilty spouse and the third party involved. Next is the women's political participation. It proposes the adoption of gender quotas, a creation of women's campaign fund for aspiring women candidates, especially those belonging to the marginalized sectors, training and support of women's gender responsive and transformational leadership and promotion of gender responsive voters' education. Uh, next, amending anti sexual harassment law. The proposed agenda provides for the expansion of the scope of acts constitu constituting sexual harassment by redefining the term the prohibited acts and the ones committing the crime. Consideration of peer to peer sexual harassment and emerging forms of sexual harassment not covered by the current provisions of the law and strengthen the monitoring mechanism to ensure the creation of a committee on decorum and investigation or CODI of cases of sexual harassment in all private and public offices. Number six is amending the various articles in the family code. I will not dwell so much on it. Oh, marami. Next is enacting the transitioning of workers and economic units for informal and formal economy. Number nine, amending the revised penal code on prostitution. Number 10, yeah. repeal the revised penal code provision on death and physical injuries under exceptional circumstances. And number 11, anti-discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender, identity or SOGI. And number 12, the divorce. Yeah. So what are the challenges? For the passage of these women-related laws, yeah, there is no existing version. Um, example of this is the divorce law. In Congress, uh, they already passed on third reading the divorce bill. Yes, at other day. But the uh, Senate po wala po siya corresponding uh, bill. And if there is an existing version, sometimes the proposed bill doesn't conform or violate 
violate the existing international laws or documents. Or the proposed bill requires budget appropriations and if the version doesn't provide clear provision where the budget will be sourced. Then, eto po, there's the problem with Committee Referral. Now, this is a problem for us because anything that says amending is automatically referred to the revision of law, the commission, uh, Committee on Revisions of Law. So, usually, it is not prioritized if it's about women empowerment. Yeah. And then next, or is it is not a priority of the legislative committee? And short timeline or time frame to pass the bill. Other challenges are complex as it involves politics and cultural dichotomy. The existence of prevailing culture of both the legislators and pressure groups like faith-based organizations and the church itself would eventually be the deciding factor of the passage of and lastly, with intervening legislative priorities and the varied stances of the legislators, it will require the support groups to play the dynamics of political parties in Congress. And next steps. First, we must inform and engage women as stakeholders of government programs and services to promote citizen-centric governance and make change a conscious effort to know, understand, and provide what all citizens need. Second, uh, we must create and facilitate platforms to discuss good practices, gaps, challenges, and commitments in pursuing gender and development to strengthen uh, implementation of the mom heart of women. And lastly, we must inspire and empower women and girls to be agents of change, to contribute to promoting gender equality and women empowerment for all women. Maraming salamat po and mabuhay ang kababay. So thank you very much, Dr. Albert, Dr. David, Ms. Balmes, Ms. Aguilar, for giving us relevant insights and comprehensive information about women related issues. Okay, uh, let's give them a round of applause. their questions using the Slido app. Uh, we have we have a piece of paper. Okay, so just follow the slashes in the back. Um, your questions will be um, posted later and it will be answered by the speakers during the open forum. But before we proceed to the second part of our activity, let's have a meeting. <coughs> so para medyo mawalang antok natin. Okay, so if you know the answer, uh, please just raise your hand. Right away. 
way to the second part of the uh, program. So uh, it will be moderated by our director, Ms. Uh, Dr. Sheila Shiar of the uh, Research and Information Department. Can we take oh, oh. Oh. So, um, please ask your, your, your name, um, preferably your full name, and then um, the questions that uh, gain the most number of votes will be read during the open forum. Okay, so let me just give a brief of uh, that <coughs> profile <laughs> about our uh, three presenters. First is... Uh, uh, Dr. Natalie Barcelles. Dr. Barcelles is the director of the University of the Philippines Center for Women and Gender Studies, and she's also a member of the faculty and was former chair of the Department of Women and Development Studies College of Social Work and Community Development in Diliman, and she was also the director of the Doctor of Social uh, Development Program of the UBC SWPC. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Barcelles. Our second um, reactor is uh, Dr. Socorro Reyes. She is a policy analyst, governance advisor, legislative specialist, and women's rights advocate. <laughs> rights advocate. She is also an international consultant on public policy and governance, social development, and gender equality. At present, she is a regional gender and government governance advisor of the Center for Legislative Development. Also, the Chief Policy Advisor and Representative Rodolfo Alban, the third of the First District of Isabella. And last but not the least is uh, Professor Aurora Habate de Cruz. She was uh, the former Executive Director and now Senior Policy Coordinator of the Women and Gender Institute, a specialized center for feminist training and research at Miriam College. And um, she also teaches global governance, women's uh, rights, uh, migration, and women, women's leadership. Okay. So let's start uh, with the comment of uh, Dr. Barcelas to be followed by Dr. Reyes and um, Dr. Diaz. Maraming salamat po. Magandang hapon po sa lahat. I also commend kids for coming up with this Dialogue. It's going to be a series of dialogues, so congrats. Happy Women's Month, everyone. Ako, wala na mong bumati. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, Dr. Albert is no longer here. I wanted to say something. Okay. No, okay. Uh, if we can go, this is the first one. Ako ba gagawa? Sorry naman. Asa na po yung kit in the pen? Or this one? Okay. But before that, no, he mentioned something about how uh, we should look at gender as not only being about women. That's right. But I think I need to add <laughs> something to that, okay? When we talk about gender, we talk about socially constructed notions of femininity and masculinity, or what it means to be feminine or masculine in a given society. So it varies really across cultures. But what the reality is that what is culturally coded as masculine is valorized, and what is culturally coded as feminine is devalued. So what we have then is a state of affairs where there is male dominance and female subordination. So it's true that when we talk about gender, we don't only think about women, but we also think about men. But the situation is that <coughs> women and men are currently unequal. So we have what we say unequal gender relations. Pero totoo, women and men talaga. Um, this was referred to earlier by Dr. Reyes. I have the scorecard actually, so I took a um, photo of it. 
tapos in-upload ko. So this is the scorecard of the Philippines in the 2017 um, World Economic Forum Gender Global Gap Report. So it's true we rank number 10, which is um, three places down from <coughs> our ranking of seven in the previous year. It's 2016 and 2015, number seven din tayo. So uh, just very quickly, if you look at this um, schematic, it shows that we are tayo in terms of education. Okay. And if you look at the, the, the graph here, we're way off parity in terms of lapit ko na nun sa ano. Ito tayo. So that's um, for primary, secondary, and tertiary education. So we're doing really well in terms of that. And then we're number one in health and survival in terms of health. Um, life expectancy also, educational attainment number one across all um, measures. Economic participation and opportunity, we rank 25th. Political empowerment, we rank um, 13th. So, ang galing, di ba? So, every time I see this, I always think, ang galing-galing naman ng Pilipinas. But I'll say this, I do field work every single week. I go to Payatas. And also, as a Super supervisor in our department because we have feedback courses. I'm also often in the field. I'll just say that um, I don't see this on the ground. Strangely, I don't see it in terms of um, improvements in well-being or quality of life. So I find um, that contradiction. I mean, it's really good to you know look at that, but I I don't know how much. Um, uh, credibility <laughs> this has in terms of our work as um, women and gender and development advocates. So just you know, something about that. Pero winner, di ba? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, down. Okay, so on the first paper on, on SDG, <coughs> how does the Philippines fare on gender equality? I enjoyed this paper pala very much, very, very much, because it really covered a lot of ground. But um, I'll make this first point, and I think this cuts across all three papers. No? Gender ideologies are so intransigent, so obstinate. So I, by that I mean gender norms, roles, stereotypes. And they still continue to determine opportunities and outcomes for women. And this is in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in households, in communities, in the workplace, in, um, in Congress, you know, in government. So. That's um, something that we really have to still work on. It's a, a challenge. Um, okay, I, I liked very much the, the data of the gender wage gap. How women in the Philippines earn more than men on average. This is across all sectors. That, that I thought was very interesting and also in, you know, very uplifting. And also the paper showed that there were higher, high, higher school participation rates for girls at the primary and secondary levels. But if you look at the gender global gap report, it, is, it expands it actually to include literacy rate and even tertiary education. So if you look at the male-female ratios, it's, all, it's over one in favor of women. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, okay but despite that, so why, why do we educate our women? You think that parents educate they send their girls to school, their, their daughters to school, in order for them to find employment. But it's not happening. Look at our very dismal labor force participation rates. We ranked 106 in um, the 2017 Global Gender Gap Report. And also, we are, um, in 2014, we were in the lowest in terms of LFPR in the ASEAN. So you think we're sending our girls to school, but they are not working. Okay, which is not to discount the advantages of having educated women because in terms of lowering under five um, mortality, uh, increased um, education for their children, etc. Meron naman. In terms of, you know, maybe the household, but in terms of themselves, what we see is, you know, the feminization of poverty because inclusive growth is really dependent on employment. So if you want women to advance economically, they need to be working in the labor force but not unemployed. Because 
you can be in the labor force, but unemployed or underemployed, okay? So employment is a pathway to inclusive growth. So if we are not employing our women, or if they are not working productively outside of the household, you will really see the feminization of poverty as a persistent problem. Okay, I have to make a point about these last two. The unequal gender division of labor and women's reproductive rights. Okay. Um, are, you are you familiar with the term unequal gender division of labor? Yes? Or at least a gender division of labor. It's, okay, the gender division of labor is how um, work is allocated on the basis of a person's sex. Okay, so for women, this would be their reproductive work. So this is the work that they do in households, caring for their children. So hindi lang yan pagbubuntis, panganganak. Okay, kasama na po yung, hindi lang pagdedede. Okay, lahat-lahat na yan. Um, paglilinis, pagluluto, paglalaba, pag-aalaga ng mga itik, ng mga, lahat ng mga hayo. Pag, pag, hindi, totoo, pang halamanan nila, yung mga vegetable. It's everything that they do for the households. It's even, it's, it's everything. Okay, it's care work. It's taking care of their husbands. And if there's, kung may lolo, lola sila, kung meron na sakit sila, everybody. Okay, this, this, is principally the work of women, okay? That's a cultural dictate. Women are primarily responsible for reproductive work, even if they do productive work, meaning even if they earn an income, they're still responsible. Okay, why is it unequal? It's unequal because how many men do you know do more work than women in households or even contribute significantly? So what women do is, so they bear, they bear what we call multiple burdens of reproductive work, productive work, and also if you look at in, in um, communities, urban and rural poor, what we call community managing work, pag magpapatayo ng chapel, sino magpapamilisin? Pag merong barangay fiesta, sino? Lahat-lahat na lang. Pag may cleaning din project, sino? Pero pag barangay captain, barangay kagawad, may may sahod, lalaki yun. Okay. So, yun yung sinasabi namin, crux yan ng ano, yun, women's oppression, yung, yung being tied to households, diba? being unable to you know, expand their horizons, self-actualize outside of, of their house or their homes. Okay. Ito, this was pointed out, the poor representation of women in elected positions, and you made the point that if they run, they have a, you know, as good a chance as winning. However, they don't run because of, again, your reproductive burdens, diba? And not only that, it's also how, you know, society sees them as, mas, ano, diba? Mas dapat nakafocus sa bahay. So therefore, we see poor representation of women's interests. Okay, but I, here I want to make the point that um, let's not automatically think that just because we have women leaders, they will represent our interests. Okay, I think that's a misconception because that's the lagman who is our ally. It's not obviously a woman, okay? And, um, and it's true that women are trapped. Nakita niya siya sabi ko how gender is so pivotal in terms of um, assigning women to um, roles in society. Even in committees, you see, they're in the you know, very female committees. And even in cabinet positions, diba? DSWD, uh, ano pa yung mga education, minsan health, ganyan. Tapos yung corporate leadership challenges, it's interesting for me kasi how many women actually make it to the top? And then if you look at the, the paper, you should read, okay? Pinatlag ko na yung paper niya. It's, I, I enjoyed the paper. It's, it's medyo a fairly long read, longer than the other two, but it's really worth going through it. But it's interesting for me kasi what does it take to make it to the top? Okay? So, so many trade-offs. Yes? Yung, you know, in terms of you know having to put up with sexual harassment, that old boy, old, old boys network culture, and the ba. And unless you're Tessie C. Coso, you know, I'm sure you're going to be harassed a lot, you know, along the way. The vow statistics. Um, I work with um, an organization in uh, the UP area, the Family and Community Healing Center. They work with survivors of domestic violence. When I ask them. Ay, bakit parang pataas na pataas po yung mga da, yung statistics? Sabi nila, pwedeng um, tignan mo rin yan na dahil may, ka, may um, awareness, may kaalaman na, may kasabatas, mas 
marami ang nagre-report. So, hindi necessarily pag, you know, umaarangkada yan, ibig sabihin, dumadami ang incidents. Baka mas marami lang ang nagtalakas loob na mag-report dahil nasuporta na sa mga barangay sa Barangay Protection Order. Important yan, yung vow. I always say, the most egregious manifestation of women's continued subordination in society is the existence of violence against women. Pag sasabi nila, ang tayo mo naman drama, equal na. Hindi equal. <laughs> Hindi equal kasi meron pang vow. Hindi ba? Walang vow kung equal. Kung walang male dominance, female subordination. So, it's true. If you want to address vow, you don't only talk to the women. Di ba? You need to address the perpetrators of gender-based violence. And these are men. Prostitution. Um, I'll just make this point. Um, you know that there's, uh, even among feminists, there's a, a debate yeah. Yeah, uh, in, prostit in prostitution. I know you took one side, no? but I'll just also make the point that there are also some groups that recognize um, prostitution as uh, sex, work. Sex, work. sex work and as a freely chosen. Okay. I just want to make that point. I don't want to elaborate because I'm going to ng oras. Okay, it, yung education, how critical it is. Okay, I know that women are educated, but they're not employed. But it's also um, critical in terms of reducing vulnerability to violence against women. Okay, and also uh, raising your children better, and also um, improving your um, exercise of your reproductive rights and health. The intersectionality. I can't. I can't. I know, skip this paper without mentioning this. I, I think it's also very important for us to remember that women are not homogeneous. That we're further differentiated by many other intersectional identities, such as um, socioeconomic class, there's ethnicity, there's religion, there's ability or disability, there's sexual orientation, <coughs> etc. So this would mean that um, programs and projects need to be sensitive to these very context-specific needs. And you know, are you, who's taking, is who's keeping time? I mean, I mean it's, time. it's time already, ma'am? Okay, okay. O, sige na. Women have control 
over their bodies and lives. Why? And also we want women to have capacity to be free and self-actualize. So it's not only we want them to help the country, which is not normally a bad thing, but we don't want to forget that women have their own interests. Okay. Or last na to, mabilis na to. Um, <laughs> You, uh, you mean last, you this the second paper. So, again, example to, the intersectional identities, they were woman, poor, Muslim, and educated, very salient in terms of intensifying vulnerabilities, in terms of human security. The ARMM region, for instance, where there's been a lot of conflict, posted the lowest HDI, this is Human Development Index scores. Women have significant, significantly lower literacy and educational levels vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the country. And then there are discriminatory, not just laws, but also practices <coughs> against women and girls that inhibit their full participation in social, political, and economic life, okay, in which inhibit their full development as persons. Okay, so development, the, the decades-long conflict in the ARM region, for instance, has worsened poverty and lack of access to basic services. Very interesting in the paper, Marcel, was the radicalization and recruitment, but I want to know what roles they play when they're radicalized. Are they combatants? See, so I didn't say that in the paper, but I want to know if the more of that. Okay, so I want to know if gender norms also hold in terms of um, recruitment. And then I saw this in the Wedge report produced by the PCW that, you know, let's stop looking at women as merely victims because they're also participants in resolving conflict and mitigating conflict. Okay? And then, ito na. Last na last na talaga to. <laughs> Wala kasi eh. Siso kasi. Paano to nilagahabula ko eh? <laughs> Oo oh, na. Okay. Prevention. Marcel, emphasize this. Okay? I should emphasize addressing the roots of violent conflict and critical gender inequality issues. Because you said that gender equality, inequality also exacerbates vulnerabilities to conflict, okay? So, traditions, gender-based violence, discrimination <coughs> in education and the workplace, limited participation in decision-making and policy-making. Oh, See? Okay. Happy okay. Women's Month! <laughs> Maraming salamat po. I take my job seriously. So actually, I Change work for women at policy dialogue. May problema ako dyan eh. Hindi dapat making change work for women. Women making change. Di ba? Kasi making... Ano? Hindi ka na nakikita. Ayun ka na lang sa harap. Kasi ako eh, text ko. So perhaps, pwede nga sa isang tutorial. Change. 
Is it progressive or is it retrogressive? Pag di mo nga ako, eh, ano, para for women, retrogressive ang nangyayari ngayon. Okay? If you disagree, problema niyo yun. Pero basta ako, ano ba ito? Pati ka, yeah, gumawa pa nga ako yan, ano ba siya? Yan, um, hindi mo sinabi sa akin yan eh. Finally, it's known to that. Pero kasi, itong, si, ano, natsan niya, meron daw siya sa sila. So, I did it while the guys were presenting, no? Hindi pwedeng wala ako niyan. Okay, ano ba 
quality of research in this country. I've read almost all of your policy papers, and I do refer to them every every time I do a speech. Then sabi ko, well, hindi ano lang yun ni so actually believer in sa research maniwala kayo that the research kami mismo. And I'd like to congratulate you because this is a comprehensive study that provides an important database in understanding uh, the women of today. Um, more than that, I think it gives a very good picture of government <coughs> performance or non-performance uh, on the status uh, on the implementation of current laws uh, and policies that affect women. Uh, alam niyo sa governance natin, um, hindi natin masyado rin na-emphasize yung accountability. And uh, if you demand accountability, accountability, you should have a very good basis for it. And I think PITS gives us that very important database that we can use in order to account for all the non-performance of our government. Um, uh, isa pa, I think the, the introduction uh, tells us that the SDG is not it's not a stand-alone framework because it's uh, it's complementary to Beijing, it's complementary to CEDAW. Uh, I've been in CEDAW for four years as an expert, and uh, believe you me, lahat ng provisions na ginagamit namin as a tool to monitor how countries really perform. Uh, but these are general provisions which require uh, backup of data. So I always appreciate that in any country, katulad ng uh, Pilipinas, no, we've reported kailan ito. I think in 2014, uh, in uh, Geneva, I was part of the uh, uh, Philippine delegation. And I tell you, as an expert, we had to read kung uh, nakakabaan ka dito. Uh, so, we had to read tons of material of 10 to 20 countries and reports. Uh, about 300 to 500 pages plus NGO inputs, which is as heavy as the as uh, the government report. So, um, talagang uh, heavy siya in terms of uh, data, but I, I really do appreciate that because it provides, as, as I said, very good, you know, uh, basis for our uh, strategies as well as our interventions on uh, the programs of government. Um, talagang inisa-isa ko, no? Uh, napakaganda ng data. But of course, meron tayong hindi na nakikita because we rely on uh, standard, uh, say, uh, educational indicators. And uh, this I found out because the one of the experts in CEDAW in our last report was saying, okay, your educational, uh, uh, access to education is very high and we appreciate that, but, but are you looking at your job outputs? Uh, <laughs> government has no, uh, does not take into consideration the dropout rates, which is very alarming. No, kasi maraming batang lalaki ang may drop out uh, because of child labor. Ganon din ang kababaihan, no? because they have to take care, help the mother to uh, earn a living, take care of the children. I tell you, we're doing research sa mga victim ng talk hang. And when we gather about 10 families, we already have about 50. Bakit? Bawat isa, seven, seven children, up to 15 children. Sabi ko, hindi ito biro-biro. Because we have a sample of about 20,000. And I believe there are more than 20,000 who were already killed in the EJK. Times five, at least, no? Uh, members of... We have a humanitarian crisis in our hands uh, because of Tokha. Uh, and uh, if you look at our population figure as well, as well, taas taas. Every minute, every hour, uh, we have uh, so many children being born. And in uh, 40 years, we will double our numbers. Uh, uh, 200 million na tayo. So we're not looking at the dropout rates of vulnerable sectors of the ethnic groups, uh, the PWDs, and those uh, living in remote areas. So yung tinanong nila yun, wala kami sagot, kasi hindi natin tinitingnan. 
As far as economic opportunities are concerned, I really appreciate the uh, detail about why we remain on the standard 50% in the last five years, so labor force participation. Part of that is, of course, the burden of care work. Uh, explain that to me, <coughs> Dr. Berselis. Uh, and the uh, framework that was used is an economic econometric model. Uh, I, I do agree with some of uh, the indicators there, very useful. But uh, I think we need to add uh, some of the socio-economic, uh, socio-cultural norms that are unmeasurable. For example, the impact of violence against women uh, to the women uh, who are not working. Uh, the social role expectations, for example, that women are expected by their husbands to stay at home and take all the burden when there is a crisis, no? Lalo na sa mga nagkakasakit. Years ago also, um, what we call this, uh, there was a study by uh, our, uh, eight, uh, not ADP, uh, itong ating management uh, uh, school, AIM, and it revealed that women who <coughs> have had all the training, the expertise, and the opportunity to become managers do not apply for managerial roles. Yeah. Um, Vice President, I know what we call that self restraint. Yeah. Self restraint for fear that their husbands will feel insecure, for fear that the husbands will resent it when they earn more than the, than the wife, and thus threatening the stability of the marriage. So I think. Uh, uh, those are some of the things that uh, we need to look at. We also need to look at the educational level of the men. Why? Because if the men have lower educational level than the women, uh, sigurado ano yan. That's a uh, trouble in the family because they will always uh, feel more dominant and exert control over the wife who is succeeding. No, and daming cases na yan yan. So, uh, so political leadership, what the system, fine. But as I mentioned, uh, lakas na resistance na mga male legislators dito. Um, we have tried, um, this, uh, Dr. Reyes and I, to really go to the grassroots and try to train women on how to run and win elections. Um, and you know what? We felt that we're succeeding, at least at the grassroots level. Until one day, she said, oh wow, we're making an impact. Uh, when one of our training was about to end, uh, ano, uh, siguro mga 15 minutes na lang, suddenly, merong sumipa nung aming pintuan. <laughs> How was this? It's a guy, uh, we didn't know if he's holding a gun or a weapon or what. Sa madaling sabi, na-disrupt yung aming training. And sabi ko, sino ito? Sino ang lasing na ito? So we called for the security guard, and it turned out that this guy um, has a wife in the training. He's a man who's 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 a Three hours, pumunta lang siya doon para gusto niya pagalitan yung asawa niya. Uh, that's not the only incident in my years of experience of training. So, <laughs> 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 oh nga, kaya nga sabi ko, kung may parili ko, ba't may makamili sok? <laughs> so anyway, uh, meron pa tayong papel sok. So anyway, what I'm saying is that we need to be aware of the uh, dynamics can a woman run? Can a woman have a career? It's almost like you don't have to consider what is the husband like. Is he open minded? Etc. How's the family like? Meron pa kasi mga ganong paningin ang ang babae na sa bahay na. And we find it in every every case, no? Uh, that the resistance level uh, to the idea that women can work independently, can earn independently, is so strong, no? And even to run for office. 
for that matter. Ken, what are we left with? We're left with political dynasties. We're left with women whose husbands, fathers, uncles have run. And so it is their duty to also uh, pick up the family name and, and run, uh, even if they're not prepared for it. No? So we don't have the kind of uh, women leaders that are really committed to, uh, to doing change. Uh, ito yung problema natin. Secondly, um, what is our election like? Napaka-gastos, napaka-violente, napaka-misogynist. I remember one candidate, si Maita Gomez, who ran for mayor of Manila. No? Okay. So she was the only woman who was running among um, four candidates, I think it was. And you know what? The first thing that uh, they hurled back at her is she is an immoral woman. Kasi nagkaroon siya ng relasyon sa tatlong lalaki, nagkaanap siya sa iba't ibang lalaki. Okay, how is that relevant to the kind of function of a mayor? But anyway, because of that, uh, because of this danger of being attacked on your personal life, on your morality, women are not inclined to run for office. Bukod sa walang resources, okay. Um, Doon sa report, meron na ako na miss na vow. I'm missing the um, the gender impact of the drug-related campaign of this government. Because as important data, as an important data, uh, that is what creating a culture of violence uh, and therefore fear among community members. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the consequent humanitarian crisis that is now in our hands. Uh, those are recommendations. So I think it was very well said. Yung, uh, data on uh, population of LGBT and their experiences, we have no data about that. Uh, prostitution, I think uh, the fact that it was always sidelined is because of uh, um, fear. I think the legislators are uh, really avoiding the issue because many, le many legislators are using prostituted women. That is a fact. Okay, gumagamit sila and therefore, they don't want to touch the subject. Uh, second, um, yung issue ng prostitution, uh, dito sa Pilipinas, hindi masyado yung debate, but of course, there are issues about, eh, papaka gusto ng babae. Ay, ginusto naman talaga. Kaya, yung blame the victim, blaming the victim is a usual, uh, conclusion of our law enforcement agencies because they do not understand the context within women, uh, how women make those extreme and desperate choices like going into prostitution, especially in the context of disaster, in the context of poverty, etc. Now, um, some of the recommendations I think is uh, fine. Um, hindi tayo monitor na compliance or the impact of uh, the laws that we have. We have, I don't know, 20, 30, 40. Magaling tayo maglabi, you know? But I don't think we do a serious uh, job of, you know, monitoring and really finding out where are the gaps, where are the implementation. I work on the ground, and right now I'm doing, uh, I've done a research in the Karaga region, and right now I'm doing one in Tayabas just how our vow laws are being implement, implemented. Uh, and I'm doing one on the best God city, no? Tayapas. Uh, what, what I found out across all of the towns that we have visited is that uh, while well, there are cracks in the system that are structural in nature, some are cultural, uh, but some simply because of the lack of coordination, lack of commitment and awareness at the community level. Now, when I ask, dahil nga ang negative lang ito nakita ko, dapat nung bayan lang ng merong well, acceptable <coughs> level of uh, implementation. Uh, and that's because, one, uh, they, have a, uh, they have a very active God group. Uh, and yeah, that's part of it, it's a regional development council. Uh, the second is, there is a presence of women's group. No, may women's group siya. Number three, may media. No? So those three elements and uh, community involvement, so those four elements are the ones that uh, drive the implementation of our programs. Otherwise, talagang wala. No? Um, and uh, uh, you also pointed out that there's a big increase in the number of judges, no? women judges. I try to analyze Dahil baka mababa ang sweldo ng mga judges.
address. That's one. And then secondly, I tell you there's so many vacancies at the provincial and local level because of the threat. The threat of anyone who will defend a victim, a victim of domestic violence, which are normally dismissed by the courts. Because the perpetrators are almost always powerful and can influence the judges. So these are some of the factors. Kaya siguro umaalis yung mga kalalakihan sa judiciary. Yung company policy, I think we need to go Uh, of course, look at the policies of the companies, and I suggest, which is now being done by some multinational company, uh, an articulated policy of diversity, inclusion, and zero, zero tolerance on violence against women. Kung walang policy at saka walang champions sa loob, lalo na yung uh, CEO, uh, wala talaga mangyayari. No? And it's not a one-time thing. It should be a sustained uh, campaign and training and should be institutionalized to our HRD, our human resource departments. That is the way to go. Because otherwise, new, uh, new employees, old employees, security guards, sa amin, mga sports coaches, everyone has to undergo uh, GSP as well as sexual harassment uh, uh, training. Now, um, you paper ni, ni um, uh, Marcel, Uh, really have to agree that all that she said was fine, but we really had like to look at the specific strategies that we may, we may employ in uh, addressing violent extremism. And this is born out of our experience in the Women's Peace Collective and Miriam with numerous NGOs as well as universities in Mindanao, uh, such as MSU. Uh, I think the key word here is organized. Uh, organize the key stakeholders who are the first to be affected by conflicts. Uh, our first attempt, which we did with the PCID, was to organize the Alimat. Uh, the Alimat are women religious teachers who are teaching in the madrasa schools and are influential in their communities. For two years, they were exposed to all sorts of training seminars on health, HIV, trafficking, women's human rights, as well as basic leadership training. So they become, you know, more or less comfortable after two years that international conferences, nila raise na nila yung problema ng hijab. Siyempre, nag-aaway sila, nagdi-debate sila. And as the only Christian infidel, <laughs> parang hindi ako pwede makialam, ano? Uh, then they talk about redo. No? This is the clan wars, killing one another in retaliation for anyone who was hurt in your family, na rape, na bugbog, at talaga mong gera. Wala pang gera na, na ex violent extremism. May gera na sa mga pamilya. So, so that's basically their problem. So they're now um, organized into a formation called Nuru Salam. And uh, I think may impact naman ang konti kasi pag mayroong gulo, sila yung first responders. Sila yung organized women. Um, we have also recently undertaken a two-week intensive program on leadership, law, and jurisprudence in the Islamic context, which is uh, co-sponsored co with a Washington-based Washington uh, Moderate Islam Institute. So I think it's important to say uh, this, pumapasok yung imam, no? Uh, meron silang imam, and they have uh, judges and lawyers that help to train not only uh, the madrasa teachers and the lawyers, but also our imams in the Philippines, about a hundred of them uh, came to listen to this training. Um, addressing the youth, yes, the youth is key to our efforts to eliminate violent extremism, especially uh, those based in schools and the out-of-school youth. You know, there is a special group na dapat pagtuunan ng pansin. Uh, while we're doing our training and our partners are doing theirs, sinasabi na nila, sabi ng mga Uh, high school, sabi niya, ma'am, meron kang nagaling dito nung isang linggo, pero iba ang sinasabi. <laughs> so in other words, naungunahan tayo ng mga extreme, extremist groups because they're also part of their communities. So uh, I think we need to pay a lot more attention. One thing I think that, that can foster inter, ano ba ito, interfaith solidarity and understanding 
understanding is when we have school exchanges, we're running a 20-year <coughs> exchange of high school students from Higit Cotabato and Miriam College, a uh, high school. So pumupunta yung mga estudyante doon at yung mga Muslim students ay pumapasyal and they have an ongoing newsletter. If we really replicate this practice for 200 schools, say in, uh, in Mindanao uh, and in Manila or the Visayas, I think we can make some progress and have some impact uh, among the youth. Um, you, as far as communications go, I think we, we need to be more specific. We cannot always rely on national broadcasting systems. We need to be located where the community is. The schools, schools of mass communication, uh, school programs, radio programs, those are powerful tools for us to spread the word of tolerance, respect for each other's religion and cultural identity. Now, having said all of that, I believe that violent extremism should not be a sole, the sole responsibility of women. Kasi kung minsan, aha, yung mga mothers, dapat supervise nila ang mga anak nila. Uh, dahil baka kung sino ang kanilang company, dahil hindi nila sinusunod yung payo na magulang. I tell you, by the time they're 13, may nakipakikinggan ang anak ninyo. <laughs> no, you, are, you are the last to know who, what are they doing, who are they are with. So I think we need to have a broader context within which we can educate the young and not, you know, uh, be instrumentalists and rely on the women and blame the women. Bakit ganon? Bakit ka ganon? No, yung nana yung may kisalanan. I think uh, we should disabuse ourselves about that. So, women's priority legislative agenda. Uh, well, I am, um, sabi nga ni, sabi nga ni Dr. Brazeles kanina, Pag nakikita namin yung top 10 tayo sa uh, Women's Economic Forum, <coughs> at tapos sa tanungin naman kasi, oh, congratulations, how did you do it? Uh, parang <laughs> so magtago sa ilalim ng lamesa kasi hindi ko alam ipaliwana. Huwag kayong maniwala dyan. Fantasy lang yan. Dahil alam natin ang on the ground that it's not really true. It's not uh, the real picture of the women on the ground. Uh, and that's because alongside those growing uh, rates, uh, rank that we have in the Women Economic Forum, in the Gang Tortoral Business, Women in Business Report of 2017, nasa taas tayo. Pero tingnan niyo naman ang ating corruption index. Nasa taas din tayo. <laughs> Number one, corruption, rule of law index, human development index. We're at the bottom. So dapat hindi natin pinapalaganap yun at ah talaga talaga number one kami because within the context of all those other indices, hindi tayo ganon kagaling. So, uh, although I think uh, meron naman impact yung mga progressive laws natin. Kulang na lang sa monitoring, assessment, and uh, review, which should be done every five years. Legislation without the required resources for the implementer Long implementation of laws is a long standing joke. Magkakaroon ka ba naman ng law? Pagkatas wala ng resources, di ba? Wala lahat zero budget. Now, how can you proceed to implement those laws effectively? As far as I know, it is only IACAT which has been receiving a substantive government support every year because it's strongly supported by Australia and the US. Okay? As, apart from that, all of those other are empty, are empty rhetoric. Uh, also, uh, the need for research and data to justify whatever laws uh, we are proposing uh, to guide the eventual implementation. I can say that uh, SOC's uh, initiative, ang, uh, the medical cannabis uh, proposal, is one of the most researched topics that I've seen. Bakit? Kasi si SOC talaga mong, uh, Ah, hindi ko na sinasabi kung magamit siya, no? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Saka, okay. Uh, kami magkasama. Okay. Uh, hindi. Talagang nilibot niya lahat ng mga research uh, laboratories uh, uh, in Europe as well as in uh, the US to try to find out what really is the medical impact of uh, medical cannabis, no? Which I think uh, should be passed anytime soon. 
so ang OPS at Senyet, walang res effective research arm. They just rely on NGO yeah. inputs. Yeah. And of course, please, no? Magagamit na yun. Pero parang kita ka na ba ng mga laws na basta na lang ipapasa without the benefit of research and data? So uh, this is an an anomaly. Uh, and of course, uh, lastly, um, we have many beautiful laws that are implemented rather haphazardly. Kasi pag nakapasa na yan, uh, merong, uh, some have strategic plans of uh, implementation, but some do not have. So there is so a serious cracks in the system that are inimical to the interest of victims. Uh, for instance, victims of domestic violence, rape, and other gender-based violence. Um, I agree completely. This DSWD has been so overburdened with having to implement the law. Uh, there's no community commitment uh, to also, uh, you know, and the local governments in order to help the DSWD implement those kinds of laws. So I think, uh, uh, yun lang ang masasabi ko sa tatlo. Congratulations to PIDS for holding this uh, very timely forum. At uh, hindi ko kayo ma-interpret kaya tulad niya, no, eh. <laughs> Ni Song, but uh, let me just congratulate also our co-discussants here. Salamat sa mga writers and authors. Thank you. I am not part of a dynasty. 
And uh, during the last election, my opponent is a woman also. And she is part of the As I'm MSP. Uh, so based on my experience, it really is a black factor to be part of the dynasty. Mm -hmm. So even if I presented more advocacies, I presented more programs and projects, still if I have to not enough resources, I didn't, I didn't win. So I am, actually I am one of the ordinary Filipina. I am not really a politician. I was, uh, I started as a barangay tagawad and I entered the, uh, as counselor in Batangas, but then I stopped for a term. Uh, I stopped for four terms. I only ran for one term and then I stopped. Kasi hindi ko makayanan yung politics. If, if you're an ordinary Filipina, ang hirap lunukin talaga nung politika. So I stopped for four terms. And then, because of the clamor of many organizations in our city, uh, they forced me to ban again. So I ran for councilor. And then during the last election, wala kasing lumaban dun sa, uh, sa dynasty. So I decided to run without any resources, without any backing from any political party because during that time PDP laban is nga, tatlo pa lang siguro kami and then ngayon, well, nanami kong independente, so dumami na but uh, at nung hindi na kami <laughs> pero napabawasan yan because even if I am part of PDP laban um, since nauna ako and I believe in what Senator Nene Pimentel started with PDP laban, I tried to file my complaint and opposition on the other members being brought into the party that I feel are not fit to be part yeah. of PDP Lapa. So, wala na po akong ginawa kundi mag-file ng complaint. Baka matanggal ka. Hindi po nila ako matanggal. Uh, I wanted to resign actually, pero ayaw akong paalisin on the reason that uh, if I leave, pag-aagawan yung position, may iwanan ko and may hihirapan sila. So, selfish reasons din yun. So, I'm here. So, every time na may nakita ako na dapat hindi siya kasama doon, I filed my opposition. So, yun. May, it really is hard to be in politics. Eh, lalo na kung hindi ka naman, ayaw mo maging part ng system. And you want to really yeah. change something. So, yun lang po. Sana, um, I hope your message when you go to the barangay level, talagang maka-impact kayo sa mga uh, women uh, who wants to join politics. Uh, mas masyadong personal po when it's the barangay level. Mas personal yung issues. So, mas mahirap for women to enter politics. Yung... Uh, local election, mas okay pa, pero yung barangay, sobrang lahat talaga nakikita nila. So, it's really difficult. Uh, I try to go around that ngayon to encourage more women to run for the barangay uh, positions. Kaya lang, mahirap po talaga. Hindi kami naramit. Thank you very much. All you can add. Yes. <coughs> just about the, what you were talking. Maybe, I mean, because of this project, we interviewed a lot of <coughs> who are running NGOs in the, in, the, in the sector. And there's really so much wonderful work and energy and, and advocacy going on. And I think if there's a way to organize all these dynamic and active groups around elections, during election time, to really encourage more women to run. And then once you have women running, really help them campaign. So we could have more of these women groups. Now, normally, uh, there are women groups that work on VOW work on other issues. Pero baka sana, in one camp, in one election, pala nandun mo maging election, but everybody can contribute to the cause of improving uh, female representation in governance. Because that needs to happen for everything else to be able to have uh, you may runway ka to get all your other things out there. So I think that maybe that organizing the groups around that, together with the COMELEC, do you have a champion for women's governance?
by Ms. Aguilar, which is very important, uh, particularly in the context of you know, fragile and uh, conflict um, affected areas um, in Mindanao uh, specifically. And uh, the question is, how do we, how can, um, how can the government devise, or, or in what way do we, should the government devise established livelihood opportunities for women living in fragile areas? Our last discussion, he, she echoed the same sentiment. How do we offer offer humanize this concept? Um, okay. Actually, kaya na pinag usapan namin yung this week kasi palaisi kan niya. But one thing, there are two ways of there are several ways of looking at it. Kailangan ng tingnan the immediate environment for women's economic empowerment. Hindi naman talaga yung mas thrive in a fragile area. But it's very important insert the perspective of community safety. Kapag naiintindihan ng isang komunidad na kailangan mong palaguin yung livelihoods for women so that they lessen the vulnerabilities to any type of recruitment for violent extremist groups. Magiging responsibilidad yan ng LGU to actually, you know, ensure community safety and engage the women. O sige, eto ang gusto ninyong gawin, gusto ninyo ng food, uh, food, uh, industry or food business, for example, or textile. Kailangan uh, trabaho na LGU na pangalagaan yung komunidad para mag-thrive yung itong specific na uh, industriya na gusto ng gawin ng mga kababaihan. Of course, hindi pa pumapasok ng perspective na yun ngayon sa pananaw ng mga fragile, um, uh, uh, fragile localities kasi ang mindset, kunan if, if ano eh, ban a solution to the livelihoods of women roll out, walang sustainability plan, bigyan natin ng kabuhayan mga kababaihan, tapos ang problema. But if you look at it in a more sustainable basis, but kaya mo pinaprotektahan ng community so that industries could thrive, then that's a, a whole different perspective altogether. Um, another point also is literacy. Kasi a lot of the women in fragile areas, ang una tinatangaan dyan, literacy. Maraming bata ang hindi nakakapag-aral or may mga matatanda na productive pa naman functional literacy to actually move forward with their livelihoods. Na importante sa pagkakaroon ng livelihood, yan kailangan yung tingnan. Literacy as a basic thing. Kailangan literate ka, paano ka mag apply ng loads, paano ka mag-fill up ng forms. So, mga ganyan, malaki yung bagay na yung literacy. Kailangan din tingnan, dahil gender pinag-usapan natin yung pinigyan ng women, kailangan din tingnan family-based interventions. A lot of the interventions for livelihoods are diverted to cooperatives, for example, organize the women and all that. Pero nagiging problema yan pag nagkaroon ng domestic violence. So, kailangan tingnan yung family-based interventions in creating livelihoods. Lagi itong nakakalimutan na pag nagkaroon ng isang livelihood or isang um, enterprise, kailangan katuwang yung mga kalalakihan. Kailangan maintindihan yung gender division of labor. Hindi pwedeng babae lang yung gumagawa ng livelihoods tapos yung kalalakihan. At the end of the day, makikinabang dun sa empleyo o kaya sa pakinabang uh, patungkol doon sa um, enterprise. So, kailangan family-based yung intervention. And a lot of NGOs actually, after the Marawi crisis, are looking at the family intervention um, in relation to say, psychosocial support at pinapangunahan na rin sa livelihood. So, I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, lastly, I think in C2, in C2, in evacuation centers, a lot of this has already been done, I think, in Baloi, in in Lano del Norte, when they started creating those um, backyard gardening, uh, gardening uh, projects in evacuation centers, they started doing that because, una, is also for subsistence, uh, food food subsistence. But very importantly, nagkakaroon na ng empleyo yung mga kababaihan. Very, very, uh, kahit mabagal. So, I think these are some of the they're not creative in so far as they're already there, but it is worth exploring. Ito yung isang area of women's economic empowerment na hindi pa rin explored. Thank you, Ms. Aguilar. Um, third question refers to uh, gender issues. <coughs> news of uh, women. Ah! Ano 
Okay, no, no, let's stick to that. Okay, um, gender equality in the labor market. Uh, is there a need for more OFW specific gender policies? Right now, we have the uh, amended uh, Migrant Workers Act, no? And last uh, November, uh, there was the, the historic signing of a declaration on the protection of uh, uh, migrant uh, workers, no? Among the uh, CN member states. Nevertheless, time and, time and again, you would hear use of uh, women exploitation in uh, certain uh, countries, particularly in the Middle East, which, you know, um, indicates that hindi ganun ka-effective yung mga laws natin as far as implementation is concerned. Those would you like to um, comment on that? Why do they think in fact they're going to have to leave the country? Uh, it's, it's sad to know that many of our countrymen had to leave. I mean, originally, you know, historically, it was during the time of Ople when it all started. It was the men who were brought to Saudi Arabia, you know, to, to the engineers and all that, construction workers. It was more the men. But then it shifted. Uh, exactly. Uh, so now we have the uh, women now are the ones who still for me, even if you have all of these laws, it's always easy to craft a law, but the question is how do you implement them? In the first place, you don't even know how many they are. Uh, you know, ten, 10 years ago, honestly, when I headed the Philippine Statistical Association Incorporated, I had the question only, how, how many are they? And believe it or not, we have, we have varying data sources, everything, the census will say this number, the, uh, the <laughs> administrative source will say this number, because yeah, they, we didn't even think of ways of, of, of trying to capture how many they are, how, what are their needs, and making these conversations. Then going back to this whole point about, so what do we do? Because there are different, this, I think this was the point of our, one of our discussions, that there are inter intersectionalities. I mean, we don't just say, hey, this is the only solution. There's no single solution for everything. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to recognize that, the, but unfortunately, we in government, we always like to, just one thing because that's the easy thing to do. You have one thing and give everything to everyone. Whether it's whether it's a cash transfer, let's give hundred. How, how much now for the for the train? Uh, three hundred pesos each. Uh, three hundred. Two hundred for the for the for students or two hundred each or whatever. But we want we want single, not single solutions. And, and unfortunately, those single solutions will not work for everyone. And then the harder part is who, is the, who implements the laws? How do you monitor? I mean, monitoring and evaluation has been so lax. We, we are very good at words. In fact, many times, my friend's mother got this and always tell me, you know, you, are, you, have, you have very good people writing all these things, but then what do you actually do? Uh, <laughs> what are your outcomes? Uh, we, you know, people even from, from a little bit more advanced economies within the region were always telling me, we used to look at Philippines as so good, but then all of a sudden, uh, what happened to you? <laughs> and then I say, well, uh, we have very good politicians. But in a way, it was also <laughs> our fault because we, we thought that all the politicians will all solve our problems, eh? uh, which, which they won't. We, we need to have that conversation. Some are good politicians, some are, well, maybe they need to be improved, but, but then we, 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 we just think that it's their responsibility, not ours, that, that government, government is, is, is only supposed to be that done by politicians. And, and unfortunately, I think that's part of the problem. But the very root of it, I, I think, no, I, I'm not even sure, because right now when you look at different societies, Philippines with other cultures, I'm not even sure to what extent you can really have that thesis about patriarchy very strong because to some extent there are certain patriarchal aspects in the Philippines. But 
having said that, I, I just say that I think one of the things that we, we've, had, we've had problems with is that we put everybody into boxes. Uh, everyone, whether men or women, we're always, everywhere, we're always putting them into box, into the boxes. We tend to, to think that that's the only thing, we, we cannot out, outgrow those boxes. We're, we're not innovative enough to think that, that these boxes are just categories of thought <laughs> that we need to, to go beyond. And uh, if we want to, to improve situations of like OFWs, whatever, we need to converse more. I, 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 I'm, I'm saddened to see that there are not as many men <laughs> right now in this forum because that also shows that gender is still unfortunately equated as a purely the women's issue. And it's not. That's the reason why the two of us have written and we've, we've worked on these, in fact, issues about even gender, gender, gender issues in way, way back in basic education. Uh, Believe it or not, yeah. we do have drop out rates yeah. of yeah. boys and girls. We do. Okay. And, uh, we, uh, we, we, have, we have seen those numbers. It's part of our auto school children study here even at EIDS. So it, it's all there. But unfortunately, we're not putting the connections because part of it is at the systemic level, part of it is goes all the way down to the family level where I think we're, we're, the conversations are not very well done because we just, you know, we put everybody into boxes, including children, you know. Oh, and, yeah. and that, I think, is part of the problem. We have to go, you know, to address, to, uh, to admit that, there's, that there is a problem. Uh, and then maybe that's part of the, the start <laughs> to solve the problem. Actually, I don't know if this is a question. It's maybe a mixture of comments, and then maybe a question. First of all, I'd like to really uh, commend our speakers. I'm so impressed. And um, I feel like I would like to invite you to my university one day. I work, I teach at the Philippine Women's University. <clears throat> Although I also teach here, I teach at the Asian Center. Um, I, I teach Asian Studies, International Relations to Southeast Asia. But I'm also a student here at UP. Uh, I'm a good example of what you said. If a man or a husband has a lower education level than a wife, the wife will not be able to really attain the dream. I wanted to have a PhD 20 or so years ago. But my husband said, ano ka ba? I could have had a masteral and PhD scholarship in the University of Hawaii. Boy, pa rin ko pala isa noon. Kaya lang, I come from a traditional family. Ang bait ko. Mabait akong girlfriend. Sumunod ako sa kanya. So I quit my ambition. Sabi niya, kahit may isama ka na, makaka kuha ka pa rin ng scholarship, tumagalan ka. Naniwala naman ako. <laughs> And dahil ambitious ako talaga, since high school, my ambition was to become a deadly lawyer. So I enrolled, after my undergraduate foreign service here, I enrolled sa UP College of Law. Pero boyfriend ko na siya. And after my second year, sabi niya, alam mo, Neil, my name is Neil, Casanova is my last name, my husband's name. Huwag ka na mag-lawyer. Mag-teacher ka na lang. Again, oh, mabait ako. Eh, ang, ma ang father ko, teacher. So I thought, yeah, it's, it's good. Sige. I did not know what to do. Bukong buhon is just across Asian Center. So tumawid lang ako. <laughs> At nag-marketing ako doon. Nagtanong ko sa kanila, what do you offer? West Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia. Oh, Southeast Asia na lang. <laughs> Enroll ka to Southeast Asia. So I finished my MA in Asian Studies. Kung laude ko na. Sabi ko, siguro kung nagkalit sa blog ko, hindi ako magkong kung laude. Eh. <laughs> anyway, the point I'm raising is, 
tout royal. Et tu as des défauts là. Je ne sais pas si tu as des défauts là. Je ne sais pas si tu as des défauts là. Je ne sais pas si Wala na akong pagpapaalaman, di ba? Malate lang ako, ng, mauna lang ako sa bahay pag uwi. Marami na akong tatanggapin eh, sa gita. Tahimik lang ako. In fact, pag nakita ko ng kotse niyo sa garahe, naubangas niyo. Takot na ako. Anyway, and that fear, you know, stayed with me for a long time. Even when he was already gone, many years. I joined the UN in 1991. My husband died, 1998. My last posting was in Japan. I was the deputy director of UNEP in Japan. I became special assistant to the undersecretary general of the UN in Nairobi. <coughs> Imagine, kung minsan nalilimutan ko na wala na akong asawa. Pag nalilate ako ng uwi, kinakabahan ako. Sabi ko, uy, wala na yan eh. You see, it takes, you know, a long time. It stays with me. It stays with me. So, the point I'm raising now here is related to Dr. Perseles? David, David. Where is Dr. Perseles? I like you, I like you, I like you. Sabi niya, sabi ni Dr. Perseles yata, which is a reaction to her paper, na may problema tayo sa culture. Kailangan baguhin ang culture. Alam mo, ang feeling ko, it's so difficult to change the culture. It will be my, most likely impossible. But I think if we continue all of these efforts to change structural problems, yes. we change the culture little by little. Yun ang aking, yun ang aking paniwala, di ba? So, we must go ahead. Doing all of these things that we are doing. Di ba? And, kahit na frustrating, how many years sabi mo, Hanggang ngayon, nakadto ka si Mo, yan pa rin. But I am sure, you feel the dent of what you're doing, di ba? It will take, it will take, <laughs> it will take generations. It will take generations kasi the world has been perhaps created that way. Di ba sa Bible? Asan ang babae sa Bible? Wala. Diba? Nasa, ano lang siya, nasa tagilira, nasa likod. Ha? Taga-support, taga, taga wet ng hair ni Jesus, tag-wipe ng feet. Well, Mama Mary was used as, I'm sorry. <laughs> was used as instrument. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Last one was my name. <laughs> but that's, isn't it? These are facts. These are facts. And they have become part of our beliefs, our culture. Mahira palitan, but little by little, we hit the structural problems, we will get there. Diba? Little by little. Thank you. So it is important that men recognize this burden also being placed on them to become breadwinners, to become leaders, you know, to, to put something on the table. Because it's equally burdensome also to them. When in fact they can, you know, they there are portions of their lives when they feel or they feel like crying, but they can't because there are expectations of society on them. And so it's very important that the men, sabi mo nga, sir, we need we equally need men to actually also this, not to man speak us, but, you know, to actually believe in the 
cause of equality. Kasi hindi naman ito trabaho lang ng babae. Trabaho din ito ng mga kalalaki na para bumawas din dun sa social expectations. So, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, Claire. Yes, thank you din, ma'am. Wives are told by husbands to, or by mothers, or by fathers to step back because you're not supposed to outrun your husband. Uh, I hear it from other people as well. Uh, and so, two things. One is, the observation about it being culture, it's absolutely culture. Uh, for me, my trepidation about calling something a cultural problem is when you call something a cultural problem, it becomes harder to think about solutions. Um, but my pitch for cultural problems is the communication to occur. Use the media. Uh, there's a lot of literature in empirical work in communication that shows that you can change cultural norms and social norms and social expectations through entertainment content in media, through modeling in media. So teleseries, you know, things like this. We sort of the out of the box with things that have to be done. Like top 10, one of our TV shows. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. So this is, it's, it's a non-preachy way of, of communicating to people that goals can change, it can change successfully, uh, and that we don't, by, by raising the status of women, we're not necessarily taking down the status of men. I think that's an important point to raise. And uh, the second point is in reaction to, to what Mattel was saying, that the absence of men in the home is also a loss for them. have the same relationship with their parents because they don't live together. There's a lot of human interaction and bonding with family that they don't get because of that divide. So maybe we can think about how to reframe this advocacy to make it also more inclusive of men. And, and maybe that's a strategic way of going about getting more uh, buy-in into the whole project of getting uh, women about um, bastos, you know, I like that. Um, <laughs> but you're, you're saying, I, I agree absolutely, para nagiging community ng bastos. But let me ask you this, I'm sure you're referring to the big up there, no? The big guy, the, the big guy, <laughs> the big guy, okay. Bastos siya talaga, di ba? However, what is he being proud of? He was elected by the majority, 16 million. And he is still, up to now, enjoying that high level of popularity. How do you explain this? Mga bastos bang kadamihan mga Pinoy? Kaya siya nagkakakain ng presidente ng bastos. Okay, ganito yan. Una, yung sa 16 million. And then there's something wrong with the electoral system. Kasi, Plurality, hindi naman siya na-elect ng majority, no? Kasi 16 million out of 43 million, plurality lang yon. Kaya lang sa atin, one, kaya ito ha, ito kayo ha, huwag nag-constitutional change, eh, darating din lang ata eh. Yung ano ha, electoral reform. Now let's advocate for a two-ballot majority system, which means the first balloting, sige, mag-run kayong lahat, pati ako tatakbo. Pero pag walang nakakuha ng majority, which is 50% plus 1, yung susunod, yung, uh, is re-election between the first two highest candidates. Para sigura a runoff, the second Sunday following, para talagang sigurado magkakaroon ng 50% plus 1. Kasi hindi totoo naman na majority. 16 million eh, 27 million man ang hindi bumoto, kasama kayo, I'm sure, sa hindi bumoto. Okay. So, uh, yun. Tapos, uh, your other question is, bakit? Bakit ba? Baka gawing 80%. Yung mga nagsaserve yun na yan, tigilan nyo na nga yan. <laughs> no, tigilan nyo na. Kasi, and, and sinasabi ka, si Rolo Dos, that's my student, uh, sabi ko, tigilan, tigilan nyo na nga yan, no? no? Kasi, no lang eh. Uh, nagiging weapon lang, ano? Nag-weaponize eh. In order to perpetuate, ano? So, you know, pero alam ko kung bakit, ha? Aniliyak ba siya ganun? 
Ganito ang style niya eh. Nyari, may nangyari. No, no. Bumagbawi siyang bigla na, o sige, yung mga taga-Kuwait na mga kababiyan, kiuwi kayo lahat. Kasi eh, hindi kayo dapat ginaganyan. Bla, bla, bla. Palakpakan ang mga tao, di ba? O, tapos, uh, pero wala naman palang programa pagbalik dito. Di ba? Yan ang the tragedy of it. O, pero palakpakan, no? Performing for the gallery, eh. Kasi iniintindi ko niya kung bakit ang dami pang bumubot, uh, 80%. Pero tigilan talaga yung mga survey niya. Uh, tapos, kunyari, uh, ano, uh, di balikan, no? So, bibigyan ko kayo ng mga ganito, sampung liway, after that, wala na. Tapos ngayon, oh, sige, magkaka-agreement tayo with yung kuwi. Alam mo, madali naman mag-sign ng agreement, eh. Ang mahirap, uh, the more difficult part is how to implement, how to enforce. Gawa namin yan sa UN Women, no, Marcel? Nung nandun pa ako, nakipag-ano-ano kami sa Jordan, ha? Kaya sa Jordan, nasa labor code nila, na yung mga babae ay, ano, may preference, may rights. Nangyari ba? Hindi naman eh. Kasi alam mo, ano tayo eh, beggars cannot be choosers, no? Kasi, eh, eh, ginaganyan tayo, bakit? Bakit tayo ginaganyan? Hindi dahil sa mahirap tayo. Eh, kasi pupunta kayo doon eh. Eh, ba't kayo pupunta? Eh, kasi nung walang trabaho dito. Y nakakatawa tayo, ha? Yung mga taga-Kuwait na bumalik ka ba? Nagmamadali silang bumalik doon. No? Samantalang, na, um, ang presidente naman, Pilipigil, tapos sa ilumang mga ba, siguro sabi ng Kuwait, lukulukot talaga ng mga Pilipinong to, no? Paalis-alis, kasi yung pala bumalik. No? Nag nagkakanda ba? So, yan ang kanyang ano eh. What he gives with his left, he takes back with his right. Tapos na drama eh, no? Tsaka my nation, excuse me, nation ko rin to. My soldiers, excuse me, soldiers. Oh. Meron siyang yung my, 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 no? Na, biling, biling naman ang mga Pilipinong sumasagot ng survey. No? Sige, okay, okay, sige, gano'n. Sa, sa, sa akin, yun ang, that's how I explain it, eh. Na, ano talaga, madrama, no? Oh, Boracay. Linisin ang Boracay. Walang nakagwalo. Eh, yung pala, may kasino. <laughs> you know? Di ba? May kasino naman palang darating. Kasi yung mga, yung mga take me down, oh, ano ba yun? Benham Rice, wala nang pwede mag-research. Eh, naka-research na eh. Eh, tapos na nga. Eh, di ba? Sabi yung, di ba, madrama. Eh, tayo.
was supposed to be a long well, paper because that's the usual length of our discussion papers. Yeah. 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 yeah, but we have, but we have uh, also the IES, shorter the policy IES, notes that we drafted before the hearing. Uh, I would like to thank first and foremost the Philippine Commission on Women uh, for graciously agreeing yeah, to host for us. Very uh, very uh, very I also uh, would like to thank uh, the presenters and the discussants uh, for sharing their invaluable <laughs> insights <laughs> and to everyone gathered here today who shared their time, knowledge and expertise. Thank you very much. Your participation has truly made this event very productive. Now, just a few words so to summarize. Uh, there's substantial progress, substantial progress has been made. Uh, there's legislation, meron tayong mga MCW, meron tayong uh, anti gaussia Act, meron tayong solar panel. So, it's all good in terms of legislation. Uh, and in terms of the, the in, uh, education uh, front, we're also there. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is that there has been substantial progress um, in, uh, uh, in terms of gender and development at some points. But there are also challenges and much remains to be further. Uh, based on the discussion today, more work needs to be done to address um, issues and challenges. One, on the labor, low labor uh, market participation rate of women. Uh, two, women's increasing involvement in vulnerable employment. Uh, third, the non-decreasing uh, violence, uh, non-declining violence against women and uh, uh, children despite bossy laws. And then uh, the issue of violence arising from extremism that results in women's displacement and vulnerability to human trafficking. Uh, given all this, we should not be complacent given our achievements, nor should we falter given all the challenges. I hope that today's discussion has inspired in us a deeper appreciation of work ahead and strengthened in us resolve to provide evidence-based narratives. This will help keep women's and gender agenda in the policy space. Let us continue to celebrate women, their contribution, talents, and skills. Together, let us make change work for women through our everyday work as teachers, formators, civil servants, researchers, and policymakers. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat at maraming salamat.